Hi everyone, I hope you're sitting comfortably and you can hear me. This uh, is a, a new system we're using um, and I hope you enjoyed the beautiful green screen that we started with. Just going to make sure this uh, is turned off. There we go. There's a very slight delay between um, me talking to you and it showing up on my little phone, but it all seems to be good. So welcome. We have 26 people on the call. Great to see you all. Thanks so much for, for joining me when you could be uh, probably doing very little else because everywhere, certainly in the UK and around the world, it's lockdown, um, which is a, an interesting time. And that's kind of Oh, hold on, let me just show it's turned up. Can you hear me better? Um, it's, it's an interesting time. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to spend some time doing the stuff that we very often put off, uh, like you know, learning new languages, reading that book, uh, learning to play the guitar, um, and also a chance to uh, pause for a minute and think about what's going on, what's happening next. Uh, so I'm going to say hi to everyone who's on the call. I probably won't be texting uh, uh, personally anymore, otherwise I'll just be distracted all the time. Um, but welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, uh, if you have a glass of wine or a, a fruit cordial with you, then uh, please do enjoy. Uh, and if you have any questions, pop them down. I'm pointing down here because that's where my phone is. Pop them down in the comments. Uh, they should come up and I'll be able to read them. There may be a slight time delay because of the uh, the feed. Um, but uh, it'd be great to have your questions. So the purpose of this is, um, as many of you know, I am an expert uh, in um, the mind-body connection. So a little bit about my background. Um, I began uh, my clinical training as an osteopath. Um, so very much looking at physical medicine, how the body, anatomy and physiology work, and particularly how neurophysiology works. And uh, then, as many of you know, I was a, a budding guitarist, points to one of my many guitars that I have in the house. And at the age of 21, I severed my left wrist and I was told I'd never be able to move my fingers again. Um, let me show up slightly on the camera. I don't know if we can get a picture of the wrist there. Uh, yeah, you can probably see the scars there um, that run all the way down there. That's it. Uh, and I was told I'd never move my fingers again. And that got me very interested in the importance of um, prognosis, what people say to you, what's likely to happen, particularly if they're experts, and the importance of our beliefs on our health. Um, and sometimes it can be our internal beliefs, things that we think, and sometimes it can be things that are said to us that we just kind of go, oh, that must be true and experts told us. So I'm always very interested uh, from that point, and I kind of was already, but I was particularly interested from my own experience on the importance of those kind of statements that people said and how much they influence our health. Now, it's not the beliefs aren't the only thing that influence our health. You know, glass is very sharp. It will cut you whether you believe it will or not. But in terms of healing, uh, our belief or, our, as they say in psychology, our expect expectancy or expectations are uh, very, very powerful. So um, in, in the end, I, as, as again, some of you may know, I see many familiar faces watching this. Um, uh, I did recover. I recovered the full use of my fingers um, and played the guitar with Eric Clapton and recorded albums and all sorts of stuff. But it, but that moment in my life was very pivotal because it really kind of made me think, well, what is possible? Um, how much does the mind affect the body? Uh, because I was told I'd you know, never be able to recover and I did recover. Um, and so I, I, I retrained uh, and I qualified as an osteopath looking at the importance of our emotional, psychological, cognitive world as well as our physical world because quite a lot of times I would notice people had physical problems but the real cause of it was um, stuff in their lives, you know, their relationships, how happy they were, uh, whether they like their job, all those things which are much more difficult to kind of work with your hands. You can, you can kind of massage that stuff away and click it away but there are more direct routes. So I retrained as a, as a hypnotherapist, psychotherapist, NLP practitioner, life coach, uh, anything I could do that I thought might really help people to make change. And um, and I find those combinations of things are very interesting. That And that really shaped what I did for the next 30 years, um, uh, the mind-body connection, looking at how 
what we think about, the thoughts we have, the memories we access, the futures we create affect our body. But also, remember, because I'm an osteopath, how our bodies affect the way our brain functions. Because our brain isn't just a isn't just a kind of an ethereal thinking machine. It's it's got blood flowing through it. Uh, it's uh, needs to be fed. Uh, it's affected by oxygen levels and so on and so forth. So our mind and our body, and one of my studies that I often mention, that I find particularly interesting. So they did a study where they gave people that little, um, you know, that kind of probiotic yogurt that you can drink. It was Yakult or something like that. And uh, they tested and they, they, they drank it. Um, I'm just gonna make a note, I've got a question there. Thank you very much, Lucy, for the question. Um, they, they drank the yogurt and, and then they uh, kept on scanning the people's brains. And what they found when people drank this little yogurt, which had probiotic bacteria that helped gut health, there was changes, direct changes in the, in the brain as a result. So we see this two way street between the brain telling the body what to do and the body telling the brain what to do. Um, it's important just to have a quick chat about what the brain does. So the brain obviously is here, pretty much most of it is here. Um, but this is distant from everything else. So the brain connects through nervous systems like wiring that goes the whole way through the body. And there's certain parts of the body, they're ch the clumps of, of this, these wires, these nerves together, around the heart particularly, and around the gut, and they're called plexuses. In fact, the amount of um, a wiring nervous tissue in the gut is about the same as the brain of a cat. When you think about what cats can do, jump up and down, uh, land on four feet, ignore humans, all those kind of things that, human, uh, that cats can do, that your brain has the same amount of neurology. So the nervous system's job is to pay attention to what's going on in the body and also to tell the body what to do. So when I do this, that's my brain telling my finger to move to my nose. But also when I feel things, that's information coming down a nerve all the way to my brain where I can process information, I can process what I can see, what I can hear. So that's what our brain does. And obviously it has a massive effect on the, on the whole way our body works. So if you've listened to one of my podcasts on the mind-body connection, you'll know all the brilliant researchers I've talked to have kind of said, we need to move away from this idea of the mind-body connection because that would suggest they're separate and they're not separate, they're completely entwined. And that kind of brings us back to what we're talking about today, which is the best ways to stay healthy. And uh, particularly in this time of virus. <clears throat> uh, in this virus time, there are two major factors that we need to think about. The first set of things are things we are passive to, those things we don't really have any say over. Uh, that could be, you know, how much toilet roll there is in the supermarket, uh, whether we're in lockdown with people we like being with or not like being with. That's just the way that it is. And of course, the virus, to some extent, we're passive to the virus. We can do lots of things to, to stop it coming towards us. But we are a bit dependent on what everyone else is doing, you know, whether people are socially isolating and so on. So there are things that we have to park and kind of go, well, not much we can do about that. And then there's everything else. And everything else is things that we can do something about, things that we can influence. And that's really where our focus is today. You know, for instance, we're in, uh, most of us are in isolation um, to, to a greater or lesser extent, apart from our brilliant, you know, health service and, and key workers who are still going out there and do stuff. Um, a little question, I'm gonna make another note there. Thank you very much, Fleur, for the question. Uh, but most of us are in isolation and that causes a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and one of the the big problems we've got is, and it comes back to Fleur's question, how much do you agree with the statement, fear is false evidence appearing real? Um, yeah, nice. That is one of the big problems we've got. We've got this panic going on. And the research is very, very clear that stress, okay, a little bit of stress, um, a bit of challenge is is not bad for us, but stress, particularly long-term, so chronic long-term stress, it's really not good for us. Getting anxious, getting worked up about stuff, getting frustrated about stuff is really not health, healthy for us. It, it will uh, knacker, it will uh, downgrade our immune system function. 
it will uh, utilize lots of resources of the brain and make it more difficult for us to think our way through it. There's an interesting set of studies where, because uh, uh, one of the questions people often ask me, because I talk a lot about stress, the question they say is, so Phil, uh, is stress bad for us? And does that mean uh, that if I go, say, to an amusement park for the day and I'm on the roller coasters, and I like roller coasters, but I, I get adrenaline and I can feel the rush, is that bad for me? And for a long time, we didn't quite know how to answer it. it. We knew the answer was no, but we didn't quite know why, because you'd imagine stress is stress. Stress isn't stress. <laughs> uh, one of the things they've categorized more recently is, are we perceiving things as uh, a challenge meaning like, a, a, oh, that's interesting, an interesting adventure to go on, or are we perceiving things as a threat? Okay, so challenge and threat. And when cha they're talking about challenge, they're talking about, oh, that's interesting, that's intriguing, that's new, that's something I'm gonna get my head around. Uh, um, I wanna find a way through it, so almost like a kind of an obstacle course. Or threat, which is like, a, basically it's defined as the thing that I'm dealing with, I don't think I've got the resources or the toolkit to deal with it and so I'm not sure I'll make my way through it. So challenge and threat and, and what's interesting about challenge and threat is it's all about our perception of it. What do, what do we think? You know because stress itself is not an absolute. One thing will stress up some people but for other people be a joy. So I used to work as some of you know I used to work with um, uh, Ed Stafford, who was the first man in the world to walk the entire length of the Amazon, you know. So for him, being in the jungle was pretty fine. It was like his everyday experience. He dropped me or most of the people watching here in the jungle and have to, you know, make a, a meal out of an armadillo in its shell um, and, uh, you know, live with big snakes and crocodiles and all the rest of it. We might not find that quite as easy as Ed did. Um, people have phobias of certain things so obviously some people have phobias of spiders some people have phobias of uh, holes some people have phobias of nuts all sorts of things and uh, those people who don't have those phobias uh, don't really care it doesn't mean anything to them so it's about how we perceive things and one person standing next to somebody else in exactly the same environment may feel quite different about it so uh, challenge and threat and what they found with challenge and threat is if you feel like it's a challenge if you feel you've got the skill set to rise above it or to deal with it then your physiology is different um, you don't seem to produce the same amount of adrenaline and cortisol and although your heart rate may increase your blood pressure decreases slightly because the blood vessels slightly open um, so people who experience an event as a challenge, like, oh, this is interesting, have that response. People who uh, experience exactly the same event as threat have a different response. Their adrenaline and cortisol is slightly different on, in their levels and their heart rate goes up, but their blood pressure increases because their uh, circulation of blood vessels constrict, which therefore gives them high blood pressure. So there's a physiological difference dependent on how you feel about that event, which is fascinating really, because the event is the same. The question is, what are we doing? Those of you who've heard about my book, The Do, oh, I'll go and grab a copy, it's easy to ask. Um, the Do is all about this, it's all about working out which bit we can change, which bits we are passive to, and, and there's nothing we can do about it, and which bits we have a say over. <clears throat> I have a little question coming up to quick read this one. It's got a long one. Okay. Oh, okay. It's <clears throat> a so question about, is ME, is there like to be more ME around? Are people with ME more at risk of COVID stress? <clears throat> Sharon asks, is it the same as having a panic attack? Um, so, oh, there's more. 
Okay, Sharon thoroughly re recommends the book. Well done, Sharon. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, when people have panic attacks, if you if you're interested in, in panic attacks, and it's kind of relevant to what we're talking about here, panic attack is where you start to have the symptoms of say high blood pressure, fast heart rate, and then your brain naturally goes, "What the hell is that?" I don't know. That's a bit scary. The, the fear of the symptoms and the surprise of the symptoms increases the amount of adrenaline in your system, which makes your heart beat even faster and your breathing get faster and your symptoms get stronger and your palms maybe go sweaty or dry and your mouth goes dry and your vision goes wonky and all those things. And the more symptoms you have, the more you go, oh my God, my body's doing something crazy, which produces more adrenaline and all the symptoms increase. And that's what a panic attack is. And unfortunately, getting yourself into that state suppresses your immune system, which brings us back to uh, what we're talking about. So stress is definitely a factor in uh, reducing the effectiveness of our, of our immune system. And our immune system's job is to take care of us. Our immune system's job is to kick out bacteria and viruses and to respond. I mean, one of the interesting things, and we don't know enough about this virus yet because they haven't been able to study, about, study it. One of the interesting things about it is for most people, it's a mild illness. It's, it's not significant, it's not serious. And yet for some people, particularly those people who are at risk, it's a, it's a more serious uh, uh, issue. But that's interesting in itself in that there's something about why some people's bodies are not able to resist it. And that's something we're going to be addressing today, is what can we do to maximise our chances of kicking this bug off? Yeah, for just, just being able to go, I, I'm going to have the mild version of it. It may be we can't avoid the bug. Maybe we can't avoid the virus. We can do what we can. Um, but if it, if it just happens that we come to contact with someone who is infected, then, you know, we'll get it. But the question is, because we're passive to that bit, the question is what can we do to minimise our chances of it being serious and to maximise our chances of it just being a mild event? Uh, and one of the key things is stress. And uh, coming back to the question that people ask about, uh, you know, should we, almost should we be stressed about the, the virus? And the answer is absolutely not. We should be sensible about it we should take reasonable precautions but getting stressed about it is probably one of the least useful things we can do and this is one of the big problems with the whole isolation thing is that people don't know how to deal with being isolated and um, people are incredibly reliant on habit and connection and that's you know that's reasonable uh, actually being connected to people is very important and that's an again a nice reason why we've got 60 people on this call that's fabulous um, because that means we are connecting and there's some studies that say if you um, if you connect with people so if you hang out with people particularly if you dance together sing together walk together um, those things will increase the amount of oxytocin in your system and oxytocin is a kind of love hormone it's the hormone that gets released uh, uh, during and after sex and in, in long hugs and at childbirth and it's a bonding hormone uh, and uh, so getting that running through your body is actually very physiologically good for you as well as, as emotionally uh, and what they've also found surprisingly is when people connect virtually like we're doing now hi guys uh, we will produce some oxytocin. So what I'd like you to do is to look at me and pretend that we're actually even closer than we are and uh, to reach out and give me a hug and I'll give you a hug because virtually doing that, even though we're not physically there, will reproduce enough of the movement of hugging and the sensation of it that will actually produce a bit of oxytocin and that's good for us. <laughs> Fleur is dancing to a teen music daily from the 80s. I'd be interested to hear what uh, teen music from the 80s you are dancing to, Fleur. I'm guessing, I'm gonna have to guess here. 1980s teen pop, it depends which part of the 1980s, but it's gotta be a bit of George Michael in there, I would think, bit of wham. Uh, but we'll find out in a minute. Uh, 
Dancing to music is a very good thing. And uh, one of the questions was about elderly people isolation. Um, first of all, with isolation, what you need to do, again, move from threat to challenge. How do you make the best of this? You know, if you've got this enforced time at home, what has been on your to-do list that you said, oh, if only I had some time, I'd get around to doing it. Well, now, hey, you've got some time. Get around to doing it. You know, is it a book you said I'm going to read or write? Is it a, a, a musical instrument I'm going to play? Is it a language I'm going to learn? Is it keeping in touch with old friends? Um, what is it you're going to do? How are you going to use this this time? Because uh, Duran Duran, <laughs> it was Duran Duran after all. Um, we can, if we've got this time, we might as well use it in the most useful way we can. Now, interestingly, you first talking about there about uh, listening to music from her past. Um, listening to music from your past, as long as it keys you into a good moment of your past, a good point of your teenage life, is a really good thing for you. Uh, again, there's some very strong research that reminiscing, so remembering what it feels like to be younger or to be well boosts your health, boosts your wellness. If you want to know more about some of this stuff, a couple of things to do. There's the Mind Body Connection podcast on iTunes. Just search on iTunes or if you don't have a, an iPhone, just go to I think Podbean on Android. Search for Phil Parker Mind Body Connection. There's a series of I think it's about 17 or 18 interviews and some, and some practical tools all about the, the the science, the hard, hard science. The, the mind-body connection is, is not a kind of crazy hippie idea. It's, it's very well evidenced now. Um, so mind-body connection, that's a useful thing to do, podcast. And the second thing I really recommend you do is go to my website, philparker.org, and particularly look in the store, the health and happiness section. Uh, there, there's loads of stuff uh, that you can download. It's pretty cheap. You can download it to your iPhone or your computer, listen to it as long as you want. Uh, relaxation, de-stress and immune boost are particularly good things to get at the moment because the more you can de-stress and relax, the better your immune system will be, the more you'll be a kind, compassionate, lovely person to hang out with. And the more you can do some of the exercises to boost your immune system, and there are some stuff, there's some stuff you can do, very clear stuff you can do, the more you'll be doing whatever you can to kick this bug away and be as healthy as you possibly can. Um, uh, hi Sue from New Zealand, excellent. We've got someone from New Zealand, it must be kind of crazy o'clock in the morning, so welcome, welcome to you too. Uh, so reminiscing about great music. So I'd like you to just pop down in the comments uh, what music takes you straight back to a time of punching the air, dancing on the tables, drinking vodka shots or whatever it was you did in your youth uh, to, to have fun. Just write down what music it was. Uh, Lauren, I bet Lauren's got some good tunes. She's just joined. So uh, what music for you was uh, something that, that as you remember it, it just takes you back. And one of the most amazing things is we have an extraordinary audio visual three dimensional sound system in our head. We can recreate songs, people, moments, smells. Smells are a very, very evocative way of switching on your brain's chemistry. Yeah. All those things will take you back. Uh, Lucy says, wham. <laughs> Thompson Twins from Judy. Interesting choice, the Thompson Twins. Oh, and uh, <laughs> it's Club Seven Reach for the stars and uh, Froda from Norway Bruce Springsteen excellent Bruce Springsteen uh, and Christina from Norway you had to feel gratulera welcome uh, terrible choice <laughs> Michael Jackson yes, well Michael Jackson's a very interesting one nowadays uh, are we allowed to like uh, people whose uh, uh, whose past have now become slightly more questionable to hold conversation about not just with Michael Jackson but loads of artists who turned out to be a bit dodgy can we still appreciate our art mm, it's an interesting question uh, Crosstown Chacket Jimi Hendrix excellent choice Amy Brooks you may win a prize for that uh, thank you Phil I have a different question uh, okay I just got to read that Rolling Stones can't get no satisfaction I'll tell you what every uh, every morning I, I used to I spent some time in the desert in the Mojave Desert, take that from 
Tracy Mill, um, uh, in the Mojave Desert. And every morning I got into this convertible car that I was renting, put the roof down, I put on the Rolling Stones, and I put on Give Me Shelter, which is a fabulous song if you've ever heard it. Very, very loud, blue sky. Uh, I can still, right now, just take myself back. And taking yourself back when you're isolated, uh, when you're not out, is a really good way to stretch your brain. There's some other studies. Um, I will come back to this one about compassion and kind uh, as well. There's a few things I haven't answered, so I will come back to. Jamie Action Motown. Excellent. Um, kind and compassion to others who are doing stress. Yeah, good question. Okay. Excellent questions coming in. Thank you very much. Um, where was I? Uh, yes, uh, so some interesting studies by a, a French guy called, uh, I may have pronounced this one, but Guilo, um, who is very interested in tennis, according to his research. And he's done a lot of work on helping people to be better at playing tennis. And uh, the work he's done is called motor imagery. So motor imagery, so normal imagery is like remembering you're on a beach. Motor in imagery means, imagine you're going to serve, so throwing the ball up, and doing that but not doing any of the movements just imagining so just practice that for a second if you've ever played tennis uh, just imagine throwing the ball up but without actually even moving your hand just really imagine your body doing that and then your other arm again without using your arm going over and hitting it this is called motor imagery and what they find is when you practice this so you're doing it without actually um, physically moving it still activates your brain pathways and the neurotransmitters and trains your brain to be better at that particular uh, technique got some more things coming through here working on sunshine lightning bolt by jake bug excellent are you lot even listening <laughs> yeah. they're probably just dancing around the kitchen which is absolutely fine so uh, as you do motor imagery, if you remember dancing and really physically, you can dance, that's absolutely fine as well. But if you even just in bed or sitting still and imagining your body moving, it will trigger enough of the neurology to get some of the feeling coming through, okay? Because when you trigger a memory, you juice that neurology, you switch on neurotransmitters, you change your physiology. So, uh, okay, question here, what do we do or how do we handle the omnipresence of the virus on TV? Another good question. So I'm gonna move on to, so there's a couple of questions I haven't dealt with, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna deal with them now. Uh, and then we're gonna look at um, a couple of techniques you can use to change some of this stuff. So first of all, how do we help people, the elderly? Um, we've got to maintain a degree of social distance, very important, uh, particularly those who are the most vulnerable, but also it's really important to keep communicating, keep, keep connecting because loneliness is another massive problem because loneliness is linked to ill health. Um, so keep connecting. And it's, it's a, I was talking to um, Professor Barry Oaken about this on my latest podcast interview. It's a kind of double bind. The people who most need to be connected are the people, let's say, over 70 who are having to be isolated and mostly are not great at technology. You guys are pretty good at technology. These guys, you know, it's not really their thing. So they're either going to have to learn or you're going to have to shout very loudly through an open door. But if you know someone around who's uh, being isolated, then do whatever you can to take care of them and particularly not just like food parcels and stuff, but spend time with them but at a distance uh, it, it's very important and reassure them you know reassure them that even though yeah okay people who are older are slightly more at risk it still doesn't affect everybody it's you know even in the countries where there's a high rate of, of, of death from it it's like 10 percent still still 90 percent of people not getting into trouble with it and and you have to remember also with the stats um that we can look at how many people have died, how many people had it, but we have no real idea how many people had it. We're only seeing the people who've reported they had it and had a test or turned up to hospital. The people had a mild cold and thought they just had flu, 
they won't show up in the stats. So the percentage of people who die depends a bit on what pool you're looking at. And it may well be the percentage is much smaller. It's you know it's still significant and, and awful, but it may be much, much smaller. So um, one of the other questions was uh, about uh, ME. So people uh, with chronic fatigue, I've got another question here. How do we prepare ourselves for going to the supermarket or any place where it might be lurking? How do we get rid of perfectionism? All the good questions are coming in now. Okay. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> hi, let me get to see you in New Zealand too. <clears throat> so, the question, one of the questions about ME. So, ME is a, it's a very interesting illness. I spent a lot of time, again, about 30 years working with people with ME. Uh, when we first started working with them, people said, oh, it's impossible to recover from. And certainly that was my experience. And then when I developed this thing called the lightning process, we found loads and loads and loads of people got better brilliantly well, got their health back. With ME um, or chronic fatigue syndrome, the, the primary symptoms are uh, long-term fatigue uh, doesn't seem to resolve even with resting and uh, some kind of uh, inability to kick off bugs. But what's also interesting, quite often you'll hear people with ME saying, when I was ill with ME or chronic fatigue, I never had a cold. And actually often when they get well, they get a cold. It's almost like their, their system is in semi-stasis. It never quite heals. Um, so maybe people with ME will be more resistant to this bug because they, they're actually quite resistant to lots of bugs. Um, the problem a lot of people have with ME is their fear naturally of, oh my God, what if I get this on, on top of my existing condition, I could be in real trouble. But as we said, this has a significant effect on your immune system. So the more you can switch off those thoughts, there are lots of techniques to do that. The lightning process is one, the meditation, mindfulness is another one and so on. And instead regroup and go, right, what can I do that is going to maximize my physiological chance of kicking off a virus if I get it or not even getting it to start with, you know, to boot it out before it even takes hold. Um, so that would be my recommendation. So if you've done the lightning process, that would mean uh, when you're going through the process of coaching yourself, you kind of ask yourself, so how, how, would, how would I love to feel? And the answer would probably be, I would love to really have trust in my ability to be well. I would love to know that my immune system is strong and healthy. And to do that, you would then recall times when you felt that deeply and powerfully. So. Um, you know how to do the technique, the process, just spend some time putting your energy into that. And for everybody, spend your time stepping away from the conversations about stress and difficulty and impossibility that are coming at us quite a lot. Um, one of the other questions is how do we deal with the news and, uh, or, or, yeah, let's start with the news, the news and social media. Um, I said earlier, social media is quite good for you if you connect with people, but we've got to do it in the right way because equally you can get sucked into social media and find yourself full of all sorts of very uh, unpleasant conversations. And the news, you know, I've watched the news a bit, but I keep on switching it off because it's like, I've got it now. I know what they're saying and what I'm allowed to do and not allowed to do. I don't really need to spend more time swimming around in this stuff. Uh, I, I want to be informed, but I don't want to have the entertainment that you often get with news where they're like, well, what do you think about how is it for you? And, you know, really kind of, uh, uh, there was a guy the other day going, because, um, you know, they closed the parks and he was standing there in the dark and he went, usually there'd be people, you know, playing on this, but not tonight, on this cold March night, these parks are closed. And it's just becomes too dramatic and, and like trying to... Uh, trying to twist people's emotions into action and that for me shouldn't be the point of news news should just be this is what they said this is what we need to do about it um but again people get hooked into it and it's it, what else are you going to do apart from you know watch tv that's one of the things we're doing a lot of so we need to be i think careful of that think about is this useful for you um and take what's useful and then switch it off when or walk away from it if somebody else wants to watch it. Um, there is a lot of 
There's a lot of panic going on, some of which justified maybe well caution is justified getting scared about it is probably not useful um other questions we've got here uh compassion good question how can we be compassionate when other people are running around like headless chickens or trying to and this sometimes happens trying to get us to to call us into their drama about it all and um what you don't want to do is is tell them they're wrong uh, and start a fight particularly if you're in isolation i remember a long long time ago i was flying back uh at like a 10-hour flight got on the flight sitting down in the row behind me there was a little kid and a little kid was doing this you now like kids do sometimes bashing their head against the, the back of the seat and we haven't taken off yet we haven't even really put our seat belts on uh, so the kid was doing that his dad was sitting next to him reading a newspaper and the guy in the uh, the seat behind him stood up, tapped him on the shoulder. The guy went, yeah, what? He says, do you not know how to raise children properly? So this guy <laughs> said to this guy with the kid, said, do you not know how to raise children properly? Is there something wrong with you or your child? And the bloke stood up and went, what did you say? And the guy said it again. He said, right, do you want to fight about this? And he said, yes, I do. <laughs> I haven't even taken off yet. I've had to do a 10 hour fly. And so the, the air stewardess is going to run over and try and separate these two people and park them somewhere else. Um, having conflicts in uh, situations where you can't even get out of the house, something you really do want to avoid as much as you can. So if you do find yourself um, uh, <coughs> stepping into a, a conflictual situation with someone, then just check in and ask yourself, do I really want this? Is this useful for me? Is it useful for them? And one of the best ways to annoy someone is to tell them they're wrong in some way. So this often starts with a why question where you go, why are you watching the news all the time? Or aren't you fed up with that? And what, what you're really saying is you're wrong for doing that. Avoid those kind of things. Um, and if somebody's doing something different from you, really do think about kindness and compassion for two reasons or two or three reasons first of all it will reduce conflict which is good for you and good for them then secondly kindness is good for them showing them kindness is a, is a small and easy gift that will boost their wellness and thirdly being kind is good for you to boost your wellness as well so being kind being thoughtful um, if you find yourself not finding that easy then take yourself away and get yourself in the right state. Think about, right, okay. And one of the easiest things to do, and Sharon will know this from the work we were doing this week on a course, is to spend a few moments moving from what's called position one, and some of the other people on the course, you know, on the call who've done courses with me you know about this. Uh, position one, which is being yourself, Position two is the other person. Spending a few moments imagining being in their shoes, imagining being them, thinking what's going on for them? Why, you know, what, what's making them be this way? Being able to step into somebody's shoes just temporarily is a really good way of kind of like understanding what's happening, what's happening for them, how are they feeling? Um, you don't want to spend too much time in somebody else's shoes either because then you become over thoughtful about them and maybe neglect yourself a bit but if you find yourself being uncompassionate step into their shoes and then there was a question about supermarkets uh, and Ika's back into the, the front line next week excellent well thank you very much for doing that um, uh, we're just sitting comfy at home here uh, where somebody's doing real work so well done Anika uh, or Annika I'm not sure how you pronounce that um, supermarkets uh, how do we then prepare ourselves for going to the supermarket well there's obvious things you can do like you know make sure you, you keep distance from people um, again the, the panic buying is fascinating it's a real there's no shortage of food apart from people are generating a shortage in food by panicking about it. So it's a bit like a panic attack, but showing up on supermarket shelves. Um, so with uh, <clears throat> going to supermarkets, social distancing, do the right things, but at the same time go 
with uh, happiness, go with joy. Uh, and if you find yourself doing stress or concern, let it go. Because if you do come into a virus, if, you, if you've got to get food, there is a chance you may bump into somebody who's got it, okay? What can you do to minimize the impact of that contact, yeah? What can you do? Obviously you can wash your hands and all the rest of it. But one of the things you can do is boost your immune system by deciding not to get stressed about it because stress will definitely make things worse. And it's an easy thing if you know some techniques, we will cover a few in just a minute, um, an easy thing to shift and it makes such a difference. And of course, as many of you know, stress like any state, this is vodka by the way, uh, is contagious. So if you are in a calm state, then other people will be in a calm state. If your voice is high pitched and squeaky and you're stressed, other people around you will start to get scratchy and stressed too. So think about what contagion you are bringing to your household and your friendship groups. What state do you want to bring? Um, another question about perfectionism, which is a massive, massive uh, question, uh, but one worth paying attention to. Uh, simplest thing to say about perfectionism is it's not good for you. And the main reason it's not good for you is you can either have perfectionism or joy in your life. You can't have both. Just say that again. You can't have both. It's not possible to aim and strive for perfectionism and have joy because everything you do, if you're running perfectionist patterns, you can see the flaws in and how it's not as good as it should be and there's no fun to be had and there's no pleasure to be had in. So everything feels hollow. So a classic perfectionism position is uh, I got 100% of my exams. Instead of going, yay, I got 100% of my exams to go, what does perfectionist person say? Something like, oh, the examiners must be easy. Or, oh my goodness, they didn't notice that awful question seven that I answered. Must be a much easier paper or I don't really deserve that. So uh, perfectionism and joy, watch out for that. So it's, it's, uh, it's something you need to get rid of, you need to lose. If you don't know how to lose it, then come and see one of our brilliant practitioners uh, because you really need to get rid of it, it's not good. And of course, lack of joy is linked to stress. Uh, because perfection is seeing the flaws everywhere. It's just a, just a bit of a, a difficult way to live life. It makes life hard. Um, right, I think we're out of questions for the moment. Uh, I've loved uh, your uh, what you what your favourite music is. Pulp playing at Gast Glastonbury. I saw, saw Jarvis Cocker in um, Hyde Park. He was fabulous. Um, I used to actually uh, be the therapist for most of the Britpop stars back in the 90s. That's another story. Um, so, yeah, let's finish with... Well, do put any, any questions down if you want. Um, uh, final questions. Uh, I'll, I'll be doing another of these um, uh, uh, connecting on Facebook seminars uh, because it seems like it's very pop popular. If you let me know what you want talked about in advance, that would be great. Um, don't forget, or as I probably should say, remember to go to the fieldparker.org website where you can get some really useful um, stuff, downloads to help you. Some of it's free, some of it you pay for, you can choose. Um, and um, yeah, I thought I'd leave you with a final, final exercise, maybe a couple of final exercises. First one, really, really simple, but a really good one. Um, a lot of people do find themselves getting into stress or not being able to sleep for thinking too much about stuff. Really simple exercise to do is just to do some breathing. And all you've got to do with the breathing is just breathe in for, let's say, four seconds. Find out what your normal breathing pattern is, but for most people it's about four seconds in. And then very often it's four seconds out, maybe slightly longer, maybe five. Just notice what it is. And then just get in the practice of keeping that rhythm and focusing on that rhythm. So let's just do that now. Just breathe in normally. And notice how many seconds it takes to breathe in. About four. And then breathe out. Two, three, four, five. And then do the same again. Breathing in just for four. And breathing out for five. And keep that going, whatever your particular rhythm is. Just keep the rhythm going. 
Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, it's very good for your cognitive function. It's also very good for your breathing, and your breathing is again, once again, linked to your immune system. The diaphragm pumps around all sorts of fluids. It's good for your digestion. But also, um, it's very good for your focus, your mental focus. And as you do your breathing four and five, sometimes you'll suddenly notice you forgot to breathe or you're breathing really fast. And that just reminds you to bring yourself back to your breathing. And it's, it's very, very good training practice, a kind of mindfulness practice or an awareness practice where you recognize how quickly you, <laughs> like, like a dog chasing a squirrel, squirrel your, your brain goes off uh, thinking about stuff. And it's just like going, come back, come back here, like, like training a puppy. This is what we're doing now. And that habit training is very good, as I say, for your brain. It's very good for your focus. It's very good for your soul. Oh, mentioned the soul world. I thought we were just talking about the brain and the mind and the body, but yeah, maybe another time we'll be talking about that a bit more. Uh, a few little points here. Um, I did ME for over 10 years. I'm now healthy for almost a year. Fabulous, well done, Karen. Um, Lots of nice words. Thank you for the nice words. Appreciate that. Uh, other than compassion, any tips for dealing with resentment? It's something I've noticed a lot in conversation about other people's behaviour. I think really uh, letting go of the judgy, judgy bit, it's very easy, isn't it? Very familiar to judge people. In fact, uh, one of my good friends, Sandy Newbigging, always talks about how almost we're a judging machine, you know, we just spend our time going, oh, you know, she's a bit fatter, thinner, longer, taller, shorter, why have they done this, not that. A constant conversation, comparing ourselves or other people and just noticing that and kind of going, oh, that's interesting. And I choose not to do that. You will do it a lot. It's something we're trained to do. Um, but just bringing yourself back from that and bringing yourself into kind of a neutral position of, hmm, that's interesting, not giving it any value. Uh, and the same with this first second positioning. If you find yourself being a bit critical of someone, just take a moment to kind of step into their shoes and go, you know, I wonder what's going on for them that they feel that way. Not like have any judgment of whether it's good or bad, but you know, there's some way of them being that's showing up here. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, Rosie, calm, running your tools, very good. Uh, <laughs> uh, Libby says, definitely breathe through your nose. Yeah, whatever. You can if you want. Uh, oh, someone like my... <laughs> One last squirrel impression before you go. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Excellent. Kindness, very important. Jodie is watching all the way from California. Wow, we've almost spanned the globe with that. Fabulous. It is my friend, the author of Mindcom. Yeah, that's Sandy New being the author of Mindcom. He'll like that I just plugged his book. Maybe he'll buy me a beer next time we see him. So one last impression of me <laughs> being a dog looking for a squirrel. Yeah, so you just walk into a squirrel. That's, that's what we do as humans, constantly zipping around. And we need to train ourselves to be less squirrel-minded and more focused on where we are right now. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I will be doing another one of these because it's looked like it's been uh, useful for you guys. If you have subjects, topics, send them either on Facebook, that'd be great to see them here, or uh, info at philparker.org. Remember, as I said, if you're interested in some more of these techniques, um, check out the Mind Body Connection podcast. The NL Essential NLP podcast is very good. There's loads of free stuff on that. And if you want some paid for programs, it's really great. I'd highly recommend the Relaxation and De-Stress Volumes 1 and 2. Uh, and also, as I say, the immune boost. And I think on a future episode, we'll probably do a few more exercises around that as well. Great to see you guys. Uh, lots of love to all those people um, who I know. And for those I don't know, um, let's, uh, let's meet up more. And uh, see you then. You take care now. Bye. <laughs>